Feel that? Here we are. All right, everyone, welcome back. Uh, we're going to start with our next panel here. Uh, this one does offer a CPE, so there is going to be the questions and the uh, evaluation form in the chat. Um, three awesome business managers on the panel. Um, so in this talk, we're going to dive deep into their first-hand experience with their clients over the last year, You know what they've been doing. A lot of them, they specialize uh, really in the music space. Um, and just three super inspirational business managers, very cool. Uh, thank you all for joining today. Um, so, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about how your clients are generating revenue, just the ways that they've navigated COVID and kind of moving forward, um, how you've worked with them, uh, the relationships that you have with them, and, you know, why business management is such an integral part of how the music business operates. So we have uh, three business managers. We have Kristen Lee, who is the managing director, founder of KLBM with offices, I think, in three locations, right? You're, you're all around the world. Uh, <laughs> LA, Seattle, and Nashville. Yeah, nice. Thanks. Uh, also, happy birthday to Kristen. So I don't know, typically <laughs> when we host okay. these, we don't have so many life events. I don't know if you guys heard, but uh, <laughs> Daniel on the first panel was also in the process of uh, uh, having a baby at the hospital. So oh. anyway, lots, yeah, wow. crazy. Wow, good, good uh, baby born. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we have Josh Klein, who's the managing partner and founder at TKG Business Management, which is a relatively new firm um, that he founded, but he's been in the business for a long time. And uh, Andrew Ula, uh, who's a royalty consultant at Left Brain, which is another really innovative business management firm. Um, they were just in the uh, billboard list. I think it was the billboard list. I mix them up sometimes, but um, they have a really interesting tech perspective and they also specialize in music clients. So Thank you. Um, I kind of paraphrased intros for the three of you. So maybe why don't you each take a moment to just introduce yourselves, your background, how you kind of came up in the space and the firms you know that you are running now. Great, who do you want to go first? Whoever wants, you want to go first? You jumped in, Josh. I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Yeah, Josh Klein. Um, I was I'm born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. And I got into the space by knowing someone in college uh, who was in my fraternity, whose father was a big business manager in New York for a firm called Loring Ward. Uh, back in 2004, 2005, I interned for him while I was in college. He hired me my last day of my internship to start after I graduated. And I started 10 days after I graduated at Indiana University, where I studied finance and accounting. Uh, moved to New York City, worked for Loring Ward as a bookkeeper, tax preparer, and that was really my intro into the business uh, close to what, 15, 16 years ago. And from there, just worked my way up, learned tour accounting, learned tax preparation, learned business management, and through a couple of different firms, same clients, um, you know, built up my book. And then eventually at the end of last year, launched uh, TKG Business Management, which is based in Beverly Hills, California, and is a boutique business management firm catering to about 50 clients, families, uh, mostly in the entertainment space, mostly in the music space, um, giving full service business management, so. All right, how about the birthday girl? <laughs> awesome. Um, I'm Kristen Lee. Uh, I, I have an accounting background, so I started in public accounting. Um, that didn't really last too long for me, I found it to be rather dry. Um, I was lucky enough to meet a headhunter in Beverly Hills who found me my first job in business management. So that was at Gelfan. And I stayed there for a number of years. I started at the bottom doing bookkeeping and uh, I went to Nigro and I moved up and then I went to Kaplan. Um, yeah, and I just started doing everything, doing tours, doing tax, just kind of soaking it all in and um, you know, left there and you know, really kind of took off after that on my own. And um, a couple of years, geez, three years ago, actually this month, I opened an office in Seattle. Um, and just this year we opened an office in Nashville that we're building up now. And yeah, it's pretty exciting. Awesome. Uh, hold on, Andrew is coming back, I think. Mm -hmm. Hey, Andrew. Hey. All right, you're, 
You're right, good, good timing. Yeah, good timing. Now you're good. All right, perfect. Hi, I'm Andrew Ula. I'm a royalty consultant at Left Brain. We are a business management firm. We are also a tech company. Our mobile app gives entertainers and their teams real-time financial data so they can make strategic decisions. On the royalty side, we reconcile metadata from multiple royalty sources to ensure artists are collecting on their full catalogs. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm excited to be a part of a shift in business management, working to redefine how we serve artists. Awesome. Thank you, guys. I think all three of you are really at the cutting edge of business management. Um, and I think the one thing that is definitely going to come out uh, over the next 55 minutes, uh, I think, is that all of you are also deeply, I think, involved and love the music space just on a personal level, which I think is really interesting. And frankly, um, well, we're, we're glad to have you. And I think it, it, it just adds a lot of flavor in how you've set up your companies and your practice. So. Um, maybe just to set the stage a little bit, obviously it's been a wild year. We have to like start everything through the, the lens of COVID, I guess. But now that we're hopefully coming out of it, knock on wood, can you guys just, um, walk us through a little bit? What has the last year been like? How have you gotten through it with your clients? Like what's been happening? Um, you know, how is your practice changing? How are, how are clients changing? Um, I don't know about you guys. I immediately went to long-term cash flow planning for all of my clients, pretty hardcore right at the beginning, because we were unsure of, you know, a lot of revenue because everything was just kind of ripped out from under us. And so the years that we had seen in front of us that were supposed to be amazing were suddenly shattered. So kind of looking at reserves and what was on hand and how long that's going to stretch. And then you start, you know, kind of piecing in, new things that clients started doing to you know make money. So, you know, for us, it was, you know, looking at the next six months, which then we stretched to 12 months, which we're now, you know, we're still doing looking at the next year in front of us, because even though things are starting to pick up, um, I think it's, it's going to be a slow build to get back to where we were. So. Yeah. I think on my end, just back when everything started to hit in March, and shows started to cancel. Like Kristen said, it was long-term cash flow planning from a business side, looking at staffs, looking at expenses that we could, you know, reduce right away. Um, mm -hmm. And then on a personal level, you know, I don't think any artist for the last 15 years has thought, well, what happens if I can't go play a show? Or it's right. always just, you know, banking on the next thing because the way the business has been scaling over the last 15 years. Um, yeah. So for me, it was really just educating them on their budgets day by day. What the you know the the regulations are happening with you know COVID PPP loans things like that. So over the last year, yeah. every month has been you know shifting one way to a shift to another way. Well, it's gonna you know there Keeping might up be with the IRS. There, <laughs> there might be a show in March. There might be a show in June. There might be a show, but telling them always like don't spend any money. Um, yeah. you know, we don't know when things are going to come back. You know, we don't know if there's going to be a second round of PPP funding and there was, um, right. so it's given everyone a chance to kind of reflect on where, where they've spent their money over the last few years. And it's yeah. educated them a lot more on their day-to-day -day expenditures, their month-to-month -month expenditures, thinking about mm -hmm. other revenue streams we talked about previously, like passive revenue. Um, right and really having them be more excited. A lot of people haven't taken a break, you know, from the yeah. road. So I think it's recharged everybody creatively and physically yeah. to hit it hopefully next year when things open up, hopefully. Yeah, and also recalibrating the business, right? Looking at what, yeah. what they had been doing and finding out what's been working and what really hasn't and looking at spending and being like, wow, do I really want to continue on this path? You know, yeah. if I like, am I really going to spend that much on like meals in a year or something. How about like, lights shit. or production, <laughs> or whatever. It's like yeah. before you always want more production. If now it's like, I just want to make money from the show right. that I've booked, you know, in the future. Right. Let's start thinking about a bigger bottom line. <laughs> yeah. So on <clears throat> our end, it's really more about going into the details. So checking to see what's at the individual royalty sources for any discrepancies, um, whether it's a PRO, whether it's the record label, really comparing to see where the gaps are. So it's not necessarily reinventing the wheel, it's making sure that the wheel is well oiled, I would say. <laughs> awesome. I mean, I would expect, um, 
I, I think for a lot of people, the last year really felt like a recharge. And obviously there were a lot of detractors over the last year, but I think a lot of people learned a lot too. And I guess this is something that we've already touched on some of the panels this morning. And I know that'll come up later today is that I think even, you know, there's been entertainment itself has been changing, you know, not just in the last year. Uh, I think entertainers are able to monetize their audience a lot more. Social mm -hmm. media has given them a crazy amount of tools to just be directly in touch with their audience. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. obviously that was happening pre COVID, but now I guess in the last year, like you guys are saying, they really had the time kind of had to uh, dive into those details and figure out how they can monetize those things, how they can keep building it and just be creative, you know, kind of take leverage their creativity that they're putting into their music or their art or whatever it might be, and also put it into their business. So um, I guess one question is um, just in terms of kind of where they're turning uh, licensing deals, you know, Twitch uh, subscriptions, I guess, what have you guys seen uh, your clients doing over the last year? What have you helped walk them through just in terms of how they uh, went about doing some of these things? I think, I think for me, most of my artists, music clients will say, um, you know, in the past, sponsorship wasn't as, you know, pre prevalent as it is today, uh, especially during COVID. A lot more businesses started doing virtual things. Um, there could be a virtual show that happened for certain clients. There might be a Twitch deal. One of my clients, I think, signed one of the biggest Twitch deals ever for, for streaming, which he never would have been able to do if he was on the road all the time. Um, so people started to open their eyes to that more. Um, that's from like a, let's call it a, a non-passive avenue from a passive avenue. Clients started new businesses outside of music. I think I had a client launch a VC company, um, and focus on different kind of passive, some real estate stuff they wanted to do. Um, and I don't think they ever thought about that because the music business is as an artist, you're either on the road, you're in the studio, you're doing a, uh, you know, a press event, you're doing always going, going, going. So for now, it gave people the opportunity to stay at home, record music, do, like you said, social media obligations, uh, go you know, drive to a local soundstage and do a virtual show. And it gave everyone the opportunity to think differently about their brand and figure out how to monetize it, whether it's merchandise. Um, so that's just been really interesting because in previous years, it was very label focused and very tour driven. And mm -hmm. branding was a bonus. I think it mm -hmm. flipped a little bit this last year where brand um, branding was massive because it paid a lot of money when people couldn't hit those other revenue streams per se. So for me, that's been the biggest kind of change, um, especially from an agency perspective. You know, you usually rely on your agents, CA, William Morris, UTA, ICM, and you're talking to them all the time about touring opportunities it completely flipped to digital branding, you know, companies. Mm -hmm. and companies. So that was a big shift from, from the past. But um, yeah, I think that's kind of the biggest surprise to me. And I think it's good moving forward when things all come back around that you've kind of built this additional revenue source from all these companies that exists, you know, so. Right. Yeah, both Sony Music and Warner have um, investments in uh, virtual uh, gaming. So it's, it will be interesting to see how the industry moves forward um, in the future with artists like Madison Beer, like Ava Max doing, um, you know, virtual concerts, um, what that's going to look like with, you know, live events coming back in the future. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen a lot of the co-branding. I think, Josh, we talked the other day about like uh, micro influencers yeah. popping up everywhere. Um, yeah. I'm seeing a lot of cannabis business, a lot of real estate, um, you know, just people we, I mean, we already had a, one of my clients has a very big Patreon business that pretty much is her business. Um, and so, you know, that just kind of continued on, but we had more people dive into that space, but because, you know, we have been so experienced because of her doing this over the last few years, we were mm -hmm. able to guide a lot of clients, you know, uh, into how to be a little bit more successful with that model than I think we otherwise would have been. Um, but yeah, the co-branding thing, a lot of bigger merch business, Twitch, streaming stuff, of course. But, um, you know, I've had people do other things like oh, I'm going to score a video game this year and find uh, they found other opportunities because they had the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I was 
I've just been continually impressed by how resourceful my clients have been. Uh, really, no one sat on their hands. They went to yeah. work. So, yeah. Has uh, all of this complexity, you know, obviously, I think just the nature of how they make money, the different things, you know, there's a million different things that they can be doing. Has that influenced the way that, that you guys are reporting to them, you know, um, that they're just digesting financials, that they're looking at these business opportunities, you know, partnerships, revenue streams, you know, well, while a lot companies. of people, while a lot of people in the music business got to take a breath, you know, because mm -hmm. there wasn't as much to talk about. There was in the beginning because everyone was kind of panicking. Well, what are we going to do? What's going to this? It, it kind of slowed everyone down. I think mm -hmm. for business management, it, increased 150 percent totally <laughs> with clients sitting around at home you know worried financially about how to make income it made our jobs a lot more inclusive day-to-day -day, communicating with them um and that hasn't stopped and if anything i think and i'll speak for myself like that's always been one of my strongholds is just communication with my clients and you know yeah under promising over delivering and I think for the last year, I've grown a lot closer with my clients because yeah. because I wasn't close with them already, just because it's the first time they actually took You're all talking over. a lot more. Yeah, they, they wanted to get more educated on their finances day to day. Um, and it was a big grow up moment for a lot of people. And it's been yeah. positive. You know, I think as negative COVID has been for the world and health and things like that, financially for our clientele it's it's woken them up like you said and it's been an educating process which i think is great yeah yeah we've had more time to digest things i feel you know we've done a lot of reporting over the years and i've definitely had conversations with clients that, that tell me well i don't even look at that or i'm like did you see the cash flow You're like yeah. what cash flow <laughs> you know yeah, of course. Um, but now they're they're actually paying attention now people are diving in they're nitpicking things and they're asking a lot of questions you know they're wanting to be more educated they're wanting to understand what's going on and you know we've always said you know plan for the worst hope for the best and yeah you know, because we did that, we were pretty well off, um, despite the kind of chaos that came at the beginning. I feel like I was on the phone more than I've ever been on the phone in my life. And, you know, that's taxing for us as business managers and yeah. the IRS moving deadlines around and, you know, changing rules left and right and trying to keep up with that because clients are asking, they want to know what's, well, what's the rule with this? Is this taxable? Is this <laughs> forgiven? Is, and we have to know these things. So it's, you know, educating ourselves and then being able to relay that to them. It's just, it's been, it's been a lot. <laughs> the, the best was, the best was like when the unemployment came out and uh -huh. a lot of like younger clients that are getting started, like, well, I got to file for unemployment. And they, you know, obviously we're business managers. We have to handle unemployment, but we're business managers. We usually don't file for unemployment for our clients. I've never so filed like, for unemployment like, before. I, I didn't even know how to do it. Before, so... It was a it was a learning yeah. process for us, you know, PPP yeah. loan, unemployment, all the different grants that were made available mm -hmm. to different people, um, and yeah. and people were relying on us, so we had to get really informed really yeah. quick. Um, yeah, constant changing rules, the tax deadlines, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, Moving target, like insane. What's deductible? What's not deductible? Um, so I think mm -hmm. for, for for us, it's been a year of a lot of more impactful conversations more communication with our clients and an evolving process and here we are you know hopefully coming out of the gate now there's a new tax potential tax change with the new president coming in yeah. and move the deadline <laughs> two days before the last corporate deadline so it's like, not come on. <laughs> um but it's good i think people are just smarter with their money um, so that and also helps. have your clients been more willing to get the documentation that we need um, along with that education, which has been, in my experience, super nice. You know, they're open to receiving this royalty information and also partnering with us to get us the documentation we need to pay them out. Yeah, I, I think the other thing to mention, what, 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 what Andrew mentioned is like royalties have become so much more of a focus from mm -hmm. COVID. Um, people, a lot of people focus on touring as the main source of revenue, but because of the boom in streaming, because of the boom in licensing, you know, a real vocal 
um, you know, focus point for, for our clients is like, okay, like every dollar counts, you know, we've, we've done a double down on royalties. I think there's been a lot of new people coming to the market to test uh, the inaccuracy of major lab, major labels, major publishers, major DSPs, um, inability to kind of clean up the royalty accounting system. Um, you know, I think, what is it? Half of the royalties registered out there are incorrectly registered. There's so much unclaimed money. Um, right. so yeah. Time to get information from our clients and their counterparts mm -hmm. to kind of go back in, make sure every dollar is being registered correctly, make sure everything's being yep. collected. Um, but yeah. with that being said, you know, the PRO companies have had a very difficult time from collections because you collect your, you know, PRO money from these restaurants and these bars and they're going out of business and you can't right. call people anymore that aren't picking up the phone. And so that's impacted people, you know, over the yeah. course of the last 12 months. So how no, do you I guys work with motion has gone up within the past year? I'm sorry to cut you off on uh, recorded music royalties from like streaming platforms. So the amount of data coming inbound is only amplified from this past year. So all the more reason to make sure that all of your data is correct, primarily with the sources that are licensing to these streaming platforms, um, because if it's not, it's going to get locked up and historically people have not been inclined to try to fix it because it's been benefiting more the record labels and you know they have higher splits opposed to, as you said, touring income. But now things are changing, there's more focus on recorded music. So I'm glad that there's more attention because it's making people get their you know processing correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how all do all how how do the three of you kind of walk clients through that? Say you have a new client, you know, in terms of just checking that they're registered everywhere. Like, what does that process look like? How are how do you work with your clients to basically ensure that they're getting what they deserve? We just do it. And yeah. if we've got a Thank new you. client, yeah. we just start doing the paperwork and getting everything in. If we see, hey, Sound Exchange isn't coming into your account, are you registered there? Or we just go do it. Um, mm -hmm. or sometimes, you know, it's that they were on paper checks and God knows where the checks are actually going, you know, so we're going back and trying to claw that money forward. Um, yeah, we just, we just dive in and do it immediately. We've kind of got that system down as part of our onboarding is to make sure all those things are hitting and, you know, make sure everything's coming in electronically wherever possible. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the first things we do. I think, I think yeah. us, like just we get a catalog list right away and you know from there you know traditionally you're auditing your label and publisher every three to five years so you know most things get caught within that period because it costs money to audit a label or a publisher um yeah. bmi and ascap you can't audit so immediately you want to go in check the works check the registrations mm -hmm. check the splits make sure they're right sound same with sound exchange um, and your PROs are, uh, you know, if they're foreign, um, I think that, that to me, a lot of people don't have neighboring rights deals, you know, if it's not mm -hmm. through sound X U S. So it's kind of like the traditional, you just go down the list of stuff that mm -hmm. you're able to collect money on, see if you have yeah. it or not, if you have it, review the, you know, the catalog that you have on there. And like Kristen said, is make sure things are coming electronically and there's not checks lost in the mail. Um, because some companies, if you don't collect within the last three years, it goes away. Mm -hmm. They won't so, reissue. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's really like a, a immediate, I think, onboarding clients. And then, you know, it just depends on if you're a producer, you're a songwriter, you're an artist that doesn't write, there's all different types of royalties. So you have to kind of go with the type of client you have. And just, like I said, go down the list and make sure you're, you're getting paid. I mean, that's mm -hmm. our priority as our job. You know. Yeah. yeah, find the money. Yeah, right. Which I think is really nice, though, that we can back claim up to three years. I mean, if that's a huge liability to keep on their books or they're earning interest on this money. But the fact that if our their data is not correct, we can go back up to three years later and correct it and request a reprocessing of that income. Um, but again, there is that still hard, generally three year window where we can take that time. Back. And, and to be honest with you, that's where a lot of these companies have made a lot of money because people don't, you think people claim three years. There's a ton of people that haven't even signed up for neighboring rights from music from 15 years ago and it's lost. Mm -hmm. 
So that mm -hmm. retain, that's been retained at some of these bigger royalty companies and, and these, mm -hmm. let's call it, um, you know, societies mm -hmm. worldwide. We're talking about the black box. Yeah. <laughs> this is the black box. So the yeah. Myths are unallocated royalties year after year that just get stored away, divvied out by market share. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Are there any other rocks that you guys can kind of point to that uh, might go on? Uh, turned. Uh, you mentioned obviously neighboring rights. Any other areas that um, I, I you think know, you producer just royalties, producer royalties are huge on the record side. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. many people have points. Even older, like back in the seventies and eighties, like publishing wasn't a thing for producers. They got record royalty points. So I've actually been speaking to like some older producers and just said, "Hey, like, are you getting?" checks in the mail still and he's like ah, dude, I, I don't know like so there's been these new royalty tech companies that have popped up or simply just kind of reinventing the wheel to kind of augment all of your royalties whether it's producer royalties publishing royalties pro royalties into one site for an artist to be able to see their stuff and have mm -hmm. information where it's coming from you know what's the platform it's earning off of so I think you'll see over the next five years a big push towards transparency, um, you know, API, APIing into the big societies, the big publishers, the big record labels, and then drawing all this data into one place that you can just log on and be like, okay, how much did I make on this song from records, publishing, PRO, uh, sound exchange? And I think that is the future. Mm -hmm. And you know, you're seeing a big shift towards independence because of the splits. Um, I mean, last year, put alone, you couldn't really shoot a music video. You couldn't really do a radio, you know, promotion tour. Um, really, we're just recording from home for most of it because studios were shut down. So I think yeah. I people's eyes to saying, I don't need to spend as much money as I've had in the past on certain things. And I can actually retain a lot more ownership over my my music whether that's writing, producing, or recording. Yeah, so I think yeah. Moving forward. Yeah, a lot of home cool. studio stuff, you yeah. know, where people are making records at home, you know, a small group of people, if anyone else at all. And so, then they ask yeah. you if they could write off their, their home because they're during COVID yeah. and making music. <laughs> right, their home. yeah, the whole house. <laughs> <laughs> like, come on. Yeah. <laughs> and also the AFM royalties yeah. as well um, that often goes ignored. Sad, um, but sad. Yeah. It's there. Background singers, yeah. you know, the background singer royalties. Like you have to register for that, and most people that sing on background vocals don't think about that, you know. And it's actually there's money there. Um, this was written by law that they pay out specifically background musicians and. Uh, vocalist via the AFM fund, so mm -hmm. be sure you get credited on your on your sound recordings via the label copy to make sure that you're eligible to be a participant at the AFM. Yeah. So what about? Um, so we have two presentations today about either selling catalogs or lending against them. Have you guys had clients that have gone either of those routes, and how have you walked them through that process? I think for me, it was like. I had an artist, a producer slash artist three years ago come to me and was interested in doing it. And, and it really opened my eyes to the business because obviously we're accountants first and we're very tax focused when, when thinking about clients income and there started to be a big market for it. I would say three years ago, it's really started to pop. And I was like, wait, someone's going to pay 15 X times their last three years earnings and you can get cap gains for it. I was like, this sounds great. Let's explore it. And then we went to the traditional valuation companies and we were finding that these offers were bigger than companies were valuing the catalogs at. And from there, it just started to spiral. Everyone knows hypnosis and Merck is, is, is amazing and they popped up in the space. And then I think it just became an alternative for big investment companies because of the growth of music and streaming. And people started to open their eyes to that revenue stream and that return on investment. And from there, over the last, I'd say, three years, I've probably bought and sold 25 catalogs, you know, total. And wow. you've seen a tremendous amount of people come into the space because of low interest rate environments. So a lot of big hedge funds, 
have entered the space, a lot of big, big, big private equities have entered the space because the cost of capital is so low and it's become a more um, fluid return on investment from traditional catalogs. So I think that, you know, pending this new tax legislation coming up, it could be a big shift in the marketplace. Um, but yeah, we've done a lot of it over the last years, especially when, when everyone didn't have the excess money because of touring, whatever the case, everyone kind of opened their eyes to, well, should I do this now? Because there's a market for it. And I think it, people became more comfortable with the idea of selling their catalog, not from an emotional standpoint, but from a financial standpoint, you know? Yeah. And I think this will be beneficial for creators as well, because if you have investors from private equity looking at these steady cash flows and then seeing issues with it, it's going to benefit all creators, I believe, in the long run, because it's going to make, you know, the processing engines better and more efficient. I think the other thing to mention, it's the first time ever that songwriters, well, not the first time ever, but the first time ever that songwriters and producers could level up with how much money artists make. Mm. That tour yeah. a lot. You know, there's certain songwriters and producers that are selling their catalogs for the multi, 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 double digit million dollars. And, mm -hmm. you know, even if you're the biggest songwriter in the world, getting a $5 million publishing advance was big. You know, $10 million publishing advance. You hear about people selling their catalog for 25, 50, a hundred million dollars. You know, as a songwriter, you sit at your house, you go to a studio, you don't travel 200 days a year. You know, artists are hotel flight stage, hotel flight stage. So it's it, it gave people a chance to level up. And I think that's been very interesting in our space as business managers um, over the last three years compared to the last 10. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so I think that model won't change. There'll still be people buying a lot of catalog, but you will see a lot more lending platforms against catalogs if the increase in cap gains changes probably. Um, and as the cost of capital stays very low, I think you'll see a lot more banks start to lend money against these assets. Yeah, and actually the presentation right after this is with uh, Milana from STEM and Stephen Hamilton from Bank of California. So we're gonna talk exactly about that. Mm -hmm. It's definitely yep. a hot topic. Um, so let, let's, um, let's see, what about, um, I, I, uh, actually one question that I had was, uh, you kind of alluded to some of these, um, tech flat platforms that are popping up to just aggregate all of this data together. Do you guys have any like specific recommendations for ones that you use or, you know, ones that have really grabbed your attention? A couple well, that, are, that are starting to build is hi is one. Uh, yep. M Theory put one together called Empress that that's for producer royalties. Um, it, they're all in beta. There's nothing there that's like to me is figured out, crack the code. It's going to take some time. Um, they're going to have to get all the major societies and, and companies collecting royalties to buy in. Um, but it's headed that way. Uh, transparency is huge. Immediate satisfaction for data is huge. You've seen every major label and publisher change their platform over the last two, three years, where now you can get real-time information on royalties broken down by song, territory, uh, statement, and even then they started doing cash out, where before you'd have, you'd have to wait to get paid every six months. Now you can cash out every month. So all of that, I think, is the first step. And then the next step is a company coming in Probably, like I said, a big private equity, a big hedge fund, a big, um, you know, platform VC backed company to kind of aggregate all this informa information. And a lot of people talk about the blockchain and what is the blockchain? How does it impact music rights management? Not cryptocurrency, because there's probably something down the line with that, but really creating this network um, where everything is just organized and it's immediate and you can pay artists. You know, if they stream a hundred times today, they get paid tomorrow. I don't think it's going to happen in the next two years, but I do think in the next 20, there's going to be the ability for people to get paid quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and that will only benefit creatives, you know? So I think that that's for me, at least what, what's out there. Q and A, um, Troy Carter, he has a podcast with MBW. He literally said, 
he looks forward to creators getting paid every single day. So I'm looking forward to that day as well when yeah. that actually happens. Nice. All right. Let's um we had a the first presentation today was all around licensing, celebrity licensing. Um so let's talk about that a little bit. Brand endorsements, you know, name and likeness. Um how have you had clients that are have been doing that or maybe that were looking at that in the last year? Any kind of anecdotes to share? Yeah, we've seen some brand collaborations going on, you know, like uh, with some sort of, you know, label, you know, that somebody kind of, you know, creates something with, whether it's like merchandise or clothing, attire. Um, we've got some cannabis lines going on, CBD oils and things like that. Um, you know, just a lot of co-branding, mm -hmm. you know just kind of like mashing up. I have a client that's doing, they have a clothing line and they're doing something with like Care Bears and, you know, just mashing all those big that's brands crazy. up. I know oh. it's, it's been crazy, <laughs> 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 it'll be cool when it's out. I'm excited to see it. Yeah. I think fan club engagement and like you said, licensing and, and celebrity endorsement has boomed over the last 12 months. Um, more from a digital perspective. Uh, not from like a, a, an in-person engagement perspective. Um, the amount of brand deals, social media posts, things like that, that artists have gotten offered or influencers have gotten offered is at a record high. Um, I yeah. don't think that's going to change because people have been so glued to their phone for so long. Um, you know, I think from a licensing perspective, I, for me at least, I've just looked at certain clients and kind of figured out when the world opens back up how we want to position ourselves from a licensing perspective, um, whether it's restaurant bars, you know, hospitality to like, we've talked about VC and, and rather than getting an endorsement check, using our name and likeness to help uh, companies grow in value and having an investment in that. So a lot of yep. people in business, um, while I'm super conservative and love the stock market, you know, we've had to open our eyes to alternative investments in crypto, private equity, startups, mm -hmm. and a lot of companies, a lot of companies are looking for um, celebrities to invest in their company because it's interesting on the cap table and in a talking point. And then on top of that, a lot of these companies are offering these investors who might be celebrities or influencers kickers to help promote the brand. So rather than a traditional endorsement check, getting a check to do services, you're saying, hey, give me equity to do services. Mm -hmm. And you have the ability to get, uh, you know, capital gain treatment in the future and, you know, and a multiple on an exit. So I think that has been something that's exploded in the last, call it two, three years in our industry compared to the last 20. Um, yeah. Those types of startup companies, which usually are 99.9% .9 failures. But <laughs> yeah. our clients are more interested. That's the VC model. Yeah, yeah I mean, our bet clients on twenty are horses and one talking about it. it because it's it's creative, um, and they're not always so accustomed to learning about you know the stock market. But I will say, COVID did open up most clients to interesting companies within the stock market. You know, um, okay. which has been yeah, yeah, yeah. We've definitely seen that some yeah startup investments, uh, a lot of crypto and. Uh, some interesting NFT stuff that's starting to yeah. pop up. Um, had a few clients generate some of that. Um, still kind of seeing how that goes over time. But yeah. yeah, I'm I'm trying to be conservative, but also ahead of the curve at the same time. So, you know, it's it's interesting, right? You, you want your clients to take some sort of calculated risk um, you know, especially if they have the funds to do so. But uh, when everything is just completely uncharted territory, you also have to remind them that this could be a total shot in the dark and not hit anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think uh, the three of you are definitely, you said conservative, but I think you're definitely also on the cutting edge. I know it's a balance because you guys are responsible just for so much. One thing um, that's interesting, I think, especially with left brain, they have a big tech, focused, which I think uh, a lot of firms in this space, the bigger ones in particular, use 
pretty old technology stacks sometimes. Um, and so we see firms like Left Brain and, and you guys, that was a little bit of a slight, but uh, really picking up new uh, technology and Left Brain, in fact, is developing their own. So maybe can you talk a little bit about just the role of uh, technology and you know what you guys are using to communicate and just gather all of this stuff, run your own teams even you know internally? Yeah, we're leveraging the technology to really tighten the gaps in administration. From a royalty perspective, it's, you know, ingesting all this data from multiple royalty sources and there can be so many things wrong with the data um, so by the time that we get it we want to have it be our source of truth so really coming up with technology that reconciles between multiple sources and identifies those gaps and then also considering you know what josh said earlier what is your creator type are they a producer are they a songwriter are they an artist where are the bulk of their revenue streams going to come from are they blowing up in Europe? Should we be looking into neighboring rights? So it's really, you know, using the technology and the consumption data that we have available to us today to inform our decisions. Yeah. Well, we're, you know, because things are moving so quickly now and like our clients are so, they're very tech savvy and they're very quick and they want immediate information and results and to be constantly updated. So you know, for me, it's been what, you know, software or procedures can we implement within the firm to be able to exact those things quicker for our clients. So I'm huge on efficiency. It's like, I want to be able to do better work and more work faster. Uh, so everything is kind of chosen with that in mind. Like, how can we simplify this process or make it quicker, make it easier so that we can keep up to speed because if our clients don't get the information that they want when they want it, they will yeah. take matters into their own hands and go do something or dig up something. And uh, you know, that's not really what we want. So it's, it's kind of a, it's always a challenge to stay in front of those things and, and make those decisions. Yeah. I think for, for our firm, it's, you know, everyone uses primarily in our industry, the, the kind of majority use data faction um, as a software, yeah. um, which is owned by City National Bank. So there's always a drive to to get clients more engaged on the platforms and the and the tech efficiencies they're building. Although I will say that you know they're still behind the eight ball somewhat in 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 figuring out and cracking the code. But they're always trying to kind of elevate software, and make it more efficient for business managers to communicate with their clients, um, internal controls clients having uh, approval access over their payments. I think for me personally, like it's very important to me that my clients approve their checks and stay on top of their bills, approve their credit cards, approve their commissions. Um, because once you kind of give away your signature on certain things, there adds liability on everyone's side, your side, the business yeah. manager's side. And I think that um, some of these platforms are, are, are focusing on that and, and getting it, giving it away to the client to communicate better with whatever, um, you know, whether it's approving bills, paying taxes, having direct access to bank accounts, things like that. Um, you know, you're going to see, you know, continuous involvement over the course of time. And, and, I, and I hope and I think it does make it easier for us and our staff that works for us. Um, from a royalty perspective, like I said, there's, there's a little bit of ways to go just consolidating, but I, I do see it happening. I think there's a huge amount of money being pumped into it. Um, you know, and I think it's a rat race to see who figures it out first, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Lewis Barajas, he's an, another business manager, mm -hmm. sent in a question, uh, kind of a reference to the beginning, but what have been your go-to sources for each of you that had the best info to keep up with changes, all the changes in 2020 and 2021? Um, certain websites, blogs that the three of you are referencing and just putting out mm. the most up-to-date stuff. I, I do a I lot of webinars, Yeah, you know? I just, I'll, I'll throw a webinar on that's an IRS update, you know, <laughs> whatever changes they made this week. Um, yeah, I, I don't really have a single go-to place. I feel like I'm constantly just researching on my own. Mm -hmm. Really, I mean, there's nothing wrong with the solid Google search and yeah. and then deep dive 
<laughs> on the internet. There, there, I, I, from, from like a music grant perspective, I really did lean on the agencies a lot because mm. they were communicating with Live Nation. There was like a coalition between Live Nation and the major agencies. And they were sending out in the beginning a lot of grants for because it's not just our clients. It's their employees right. too that are reaching out to us saying, hey, uh, you know, do you know about this? So mm-hmm. we had to lean on a lot of different sources of information to try and help them out. I mean, obviously, the only place most accountants look for any tax changes is the IRS.gov website. Uh, yeah. You can't believe you read out there all the time. And from a PP peer perspective, you know, I leaned on the banks um, yeah. and the SBA directly. Because mm-hmm. as, as you can imagine, every day for the first, you know, until the money hit for the first PPP loan, and even after the money hit, and even till today, the rules keep changing. Yeah. So, you know, you get a, a Google alert, something happens, and then the next day there's another Google alert. So you have to go to the source. Right. Uh, and, and usually the bank helps you through that. So that's been a, pri- you know. My primary, my primary news sources are the bank, agencies when it comes to music grants for touring or Save the Stages or things like that, um, and the IRS, you know, for, for yeah. tax stuff. Mm-hmm. I want to just give a shout out to the MLC. They're um, also going to be a part of this conference, yeah. but they have been so good with their content this year, and not only from the focus of US interactive streaming, but they really do cover a lot of the other bases um, throughout the entire industry. So if you want to know how Sound Exchange collects, I mean, they don't collect on behalf of Sound Exchange, but they do have references there um, that explains it. Yeah, I can second that. I mean, we follow them and have been, I'm super excited. Chris is on later, but um, even like we get a lot of info out of them and uh, it's kind of amazing actually how quickly they've just been putting stuff out really. I mean, they, they must have a pretty large team uh, just gathering all of that stuff. They're very fast. Um, one question. So I kind of have like a, a personal vendetta against the term business manager. Cause I feel like it just does not adequately tell the story of what you guys do. I don't know who came up with that, but it's like kind of bizarre, I think. Um, one question that I have for you, and this just comes up because I think obviously a lot of these clients are getting more complex. They're making money in much different ways. Just the nature of entertainment itself is changing. Um, Kristen, you mentioned that you have a client that's exclusively making money off of, um, uh, what was it again? Uh, Patreon, Patreon, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how are you finding like new client types are you getting into like esports are there new clients coming to you that you know that you guys are working with from different spaces than you know previously yeah we're seeing different types of content creators i guess you could say um you know visual artists and um tech people it's been interesting i mean there's in the last year people being at home they're getting more creative, right? They're coming up with new models and ideas or new ventures. So we're definitely seeing things kind of expand uh, outside of, you know, what we would normally consider an artist. Um, But, you know, I don't, there's nothing, there's nothing like massively wave changing yet. Although I do think that it's kind of at the beginning, I think that these things will probably change a lot in coming years, but there's just a lot of new stuff bubbling up right now in front of us. Yeah. I think for me, it's been more of a focus, like we're personal CFOs, Um, you know, and I think we're just lucky to be in the music business and represent cool, you know, people always tell my, my, my son and my wife, I'm the coolest accountant you'll ever meet. Um, But that's just a reflection of our clients. And Mm -hmm. I think like, I said, we represent artists primarily, but that doesn't mean we don't represent business owners. Influencers have been become a major business in the last few years. Now they're being represented by business managers. Um, you've always had your traditional athletes and entertainers in film and TV. Um, there's been a lot of shift towards tech founders and, on, and entrepreneurs exiting their companies, whether it's tech, you know, CPG, whatever the case may be. Um, there's a need. Gamers. For- yeah, gamers, like you said, like mm. esports gamers. Um, so I think I think there's there's a need for us for the right type of client. Um, 
you know, when you're a business manager, you're doing kind of, you can do a la carte services where we're just doing your taxes, or you can do full service where we're running your financial life day to day. Um, you know, my firm's more boutique, so we don't really do a lot of tax only business, but I think, you know, as, as it's, it's a luxury to be honest with you, it's not a necessity for everybody. Business managers are a luxury for people that, um, you know, cannot day to day manage their own finances because they're traveling or they want to be educated more, um, specifically in music, you know, when you're on the road, you can't be at home paying your bills all the time. And paying your staff, mm -hmm. so you need a CFO. And we're a back office, you know, accounting firm for them. So um, yeah, yeah. It's not that they're not capable, right? I feel like a lot of my clients are highly intelligent and could totally 100%. do this by themselves. But you know, it's just yeah, they don't have time or the wherewithal because if you're using that brain power to do what we're doing all day, then you can't be creative and actually create. And we need our clients to create and you know make things because that's how we make our money <laughs> exactly. so i need i need them to have as much creative space as possible so for me it's it's important to give them as much breathing room as they'll take you know mm -hmm. what about um for you guys more internally uh, with your own companies, hiring, we hear continuously is one of the most difficult things for business managers, kind of finding the right team members um, with the right skill sets. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, your own company growth, how you go about hiring, just like your teams, your teams in general and how you set it up? Yeah, I think I think for me, you know, when I when I launched the new firm and I was at a former firm and we kind of split the offices and uh, you know, all my employees in LA, I, I used to live in New York city for, for a long time. I moved out to LA three and a half years ago with two people and built the firm up and then exited the last firm with the same employees and staff. So we're at 12, 13 now and a real focus on, on growing. Um, it's very competitive, especially after COVID. A lot of people are scared to leave. They're unsure. Uh, when touring got shut down, a lot of firms, either furloughed or let go of, you know, specific related staff to turn or shifted them into different positions. Um, you know, you're looking for people with experience because it's not general bookkeeping accounting. It's a different business when it comes to the music business. So you always want to have someone with experience. And, and most people think it's a nine to five gig. It's not. It's a 24 seven gig when it comes to <laughs> R&D general accounting. Um, I mean, we're talking about for business managers with musicians that are tour and are in yeah. this is the full service model. Um, so I think, I think for, for me, I just want to give, you know, younger people the ability to learn about the industry. And mm -hmm. for me, when I was getting in school, I was always like, I love sports. I love entertainment. I don't want to be a lawyer. My dad was a lawyer and all he did was read contracts all day. I'm not <laughs> sure I'm right to just be, you know, general accountant, Joe Schmo for regular Joe Schmo people, which is okay. And there's nothing wrong with that. And there's this huge industry that was available. And I was like, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. And I'm 37. So I'm, I'm on the younger side of let's call the spectrum from founders and, you know, CEOs of these firms. And then you look below uh, my age gr group. And it just, there's not a lot of people that know about it. Yeah, exactly. So I think giving people the opportunity to learn about it um, will drive a lot more traffic into our space. But right now, super competitive, um, hard to find people. Um, you know, I'm interviewing a lot of people on the day the interview happens, there's five other offers. Uh, you know, it's, it's especially in LA. New York's a little different because there's not as many firms as, as LA. Um, but you're seeing the firms pop up in Miami and Texas and all over the country. So I, I do think it will be a growing space. Um, but most people are like, wait, what's a business manager? You know, it's such mm -hmm. a general term. So I yeah. think, um, you know, it's, it's really an outsourced accountant, personal CFO. And it just mm -hmm. depends on what industry you're in, you know? So that for me has been the experience so far. Yeah. 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 As the needs of our business change, so do the 
competencies that are needed within the firm. So I would say, you know, prior to working with Left Brain, I was working in-house in royalties and there is a need for royalties in business management now as, you know, consumption's going up with on streaming platforms. So, you know, it's it's the learning that's going into it and also, you know, just the opportunity to learn about the industry, I would have to say. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, on that note, traditionally a lot of business managers, you know, stay quiet and under the radar. And I think I've done the opposite of that. I just like to talk about my job a lot. But it's I think it's important. This is this is a big industry, it's a big business, and it's really cool. I mean, accounting can be very dry and boring and mm -hmm. I've tried that out and and I found this and I've never looked back and I can't imagine doing anything else. And I love my job and I love coming to work and I love my clients and, um, and my staff and it's a huge part of who I am. And I want to, uh, you know, impart that excitement onto other young people that are in accounting and finance or, you know, whatever, um, you know, educational track they're going on that this is an option for them. And, and not only is it like, fun and exciting it's you know you can be wildly successful in this space mm. you know it's a great career i mean when I you just want to also highlight the visibility that you know goes into business management you really do see all sorts of different income streams as in comparison if you work for a record label or a publisher really looking at a well, you see everything you, you see we literally everything. see everything everything, <laughs> everything. <laughs> Yeah. For best or worst. I mean, when you see articles like 75% of uh, Gen Z want to be YouTubers or creators or whatever, and the way that they're able to monetize these relatively niche audiences now is unbelievable. And the reality is that I think all of them need a, a backbone of what you guys do to support a business like that. And, and don't get it twisted. Like, we're constantly being educated, too, mm -hmm. on the new yeah. industries, the different things being popped yeah. up. But like that. That's the thing is you can't you can't, uh, you know, only say, well, I don't, I don't think this is a good idea. You know, the startups aren't going to do, you have to lend advice and guidance to people, even though you're, you know, might be conservative, you have to open your eyes to the new things. It's like when I call yeah. a money manager at JP Morgan, I said, what do you, what do you think of crypto? And they're like, I, I don't invest in things I don't know. I agree to a certain de degree, but that doesn't change the fact that my client who's got majority of his finances with you is calling me saying, Hey man, like, what do you think about crypto? So I think you're going to see an evolution of older generational accounting firms have to, you know, get more modernized with the different types of uh, investments, um, you know, platforms, uh, royalty streams when it comes to our business per se. Um, different licensing deals. I mean, film and TV is a whole other thing we didn't talk about today, but there's so much changes going yeah. on there too that uh, yeah. you know, people have to get up to date on. It's just not the old school, you know, get a check in the mail every six months, do a show, get paid. You know, it, it's totally, you know, across the board changed. Um, MCM yeah. for, for influencers, you know, you hear about only fans, like how much money people are making there. Um, yeah. So it's, it's just, you know, it's something that we're constantly being educated on every day to continuously move forward in our business. Yeah. I mean, that's what gets me, frankly, fired up. Uh, I mean, that's the reason that we founded Trusted Advisor was because I mm -hmm. think you guys are really at the crux of all of this. I think it has kind of a marketing issue just in terms of like branding business managers, right? So if we could be a part of just giving a platform to you guys and all the work that you do, um, then uh, we will have succeeded. So, we um, I think, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Look, I appreciate We're always the underdogs in the business. People, people like to keep us, you know, know. behind the scenes and, and, and not to say we should be on the, on the front line, but, you know, I constantly find my clients always just being like, I don't know what I would do without a business manager. Yep. You know, yeah. usually you only hear about management, legal agent. Mm -hmm. um, but the majority of the work when it comes to paying, getting paid and paying people, which is really, I always tell my clients, like, I'm an accountant. I'm a cool accountant. I still go to work every day. Just like you, you might be an artist, but this is your job, you know, and you go to work every day too. 
it's the same thing. You got to put effort into it, and 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 it's just interesting to kind of see the evolution of our position within the industry. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, the money well, is the most important part, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Why we all came here? <laughs> Someone's got to manage it. Yeah. Hey, huge thank you to the three of you for taking the time to put this together. Uh, for all of your insight, um, I would highly suggest everyone go follow these people, connect with them on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, yeah, just stay tuned for, I'm sure, more news uh, from the three of them. So thank you guys. Uh, Happy thanks birthday, for joining us today. Time. Exactly. Thank, Happy thank birthday, you. Kristen. Enjoy the rest of your thank day. You. Happy birthday. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.